Well, good morning, church. And uh, if you're like me, you're in the middle of a heat wave. Um, and so this morning, if that's uh, where you're at, I just hope that wherever you are in BC, that you're staying safe and you're being wise. And uh, yeah, we'll get through this together, won't we? Just like everything else. Uh, this morning, um, we're going to be continuing on in our uh, uh, study in Philippians. We've gone through the first chapter and we're going to be getting, uh, be getting into chapter two. And so today as we look at Paul's letter to the Philippian church in, uh, in prison, as he's in prison, uh, Philippi was about 800 miles from where Paul was, was uh, crafting this letter in Rome. And so let's get into chapter two. And this morning, I'm just going to be taking a look at the first 11 verses. So I'm going to break this down, these first 11 verses into two parts. First, we're going to look in verses one through four, where Paul is giving to the Philippian believers. And so to us today, he's giving a principle that he wants the Philippian believers to apply to their everyday lives, how they live in the world. And so um, that's in the first four verses, and then from 5 to 11, where Paul then kind of switches and he gives them a picture, an example of Jesus Christ himself and how Jesus himself applied these principles when he lived on the earth. So let's get into God's word this morning, and we're going to pick it up at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 2. Let's just pray before we read God's word. Lord, you are the God from whom all blessings flow. And so, God, as we uh, want to learn from you and to continue to be empowered in our living by you, Lord, we want to draw close to your word. Your word is life, and, uh, and your word offers life solutions to, to what we're going through in life. And so, God, as we lean into your word this morning, we want to lean into you. And Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would minister to our hearts as we look at our lives today and look at the life and the example of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. So let's look at uh, chapter 2, 1 through 11. Paul says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look out to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. May God bless the reading of his word and our time of study together. So as Paul begins verse 1, he says, if there is any encouragement that you and I have in being a Christian, and I mean being a believer and united in Christ Jesus, or he says, if you've ever been comforted by the love of God, or if you have any, or, or, or if you have the Holy Spirit living within you. And so, we, so he's talking about brothers and sisters. He's talking about us who are the faithful. He's talking about the church, all believers. Uh, or he says, if you have any tenderness or any compassion within you, he says, have the same mindset in you that was in Christ Jesus. I, I love the words that he brings out to us. And I think about my own life, you know, that word encouragement. 
as as I have received encouragement, the encouragement that comes in my relationship with Jesus Christ, then the flip side, you know, is for me as well. Am I now, am I an encourager? Am I known to others that God has put in my life as somebody who brings courage into the moment, who brings courage into their lives? Or if I've been comforted by the love of God, now as, as I'm growing in that over the years, it, am I more and more seen by others as somebody who can come alongside somebody else with comfort, the comfort that I've received out of the love of God, now I can give it. Or tenderness or compassion, you know, do others see the Holy Spirit as alive and well in my life and in your life? That's, that's what we need to be thinking about when we read scriptures like this, is that that sense of, okay, as I am progressing in, in years, not just in age, but in my relationship with God over the years, are these things becoming more and more true in my life? So as he says, have the same mindset in you that was in Christ Jesus. So what was that mindset? Well, first of all, he says, don't do anything with, with selfish motives. Don't do anything with vain conceit. You know, children, when children are born into this world, children, one of the early traits that they have, and it's many years before that kind of grows and develops into something else, but when they are young, they have this me-centric or a, a me-ordered world. Everything that they see, everything that they touch, everything that they taste is is ordered by, you know, that me me first or me centric kind of focus of the world they're they're not just literal little miniature versions of us okay their brain development literally renders them only capable of certain responses of certain ways even to view their world and paul says in another letter to another congregation he says that you know as we grow in the lord over time we've got to begin to Start putting childish ways behind us, childish thinking, childish ways of living and perceiving even our relationship with Jesus Christ. And one of the hallmarks of you and I moving into adulthood is in our brain development. And, and it's the, the ability to change our worldview, to change a lens of how we have been viewing our ordered world. New creations in Christ Jesus, that's what Paul calls us. He says, you know, now is the time to, to switch and begin filtering through another lens. Now as a child of God, now as one who has been freed from the penalty of sin and death and now is living for God and for his glory. Our ordered world worldview needs to change. The ability to go from me-centric thinking and me-centric, you know, acting in life to now kingdom-centric, Christ-centric, others-centric worldview. And so he goes on to say, Paul, Paul is talking about having the mindset of Christ within us. He says, church, we need to consider other people as more valuable, as more important than ourselves. That, that word consider that we have in our uh, English speaking, in our English Bibles, it comes from a Greek word, but something gets lost, I think, in translation. When we hear that word consider, we've got a different approach to that word consider. I mean, we'll say things like, yeah, I'm... I'm considering an, another job. I'm considering a new position. Or, or, yeah, I've been considering, you know, what to eat for lunch. I'm looking at the menu and I'm, I'm considering what it is that, that I really want. Or we'll say, I, I'm considering having children. Or I'm considering what kind of ice cream that I want, you know, what flavor that I want today. Or I'm considering what to do in this situation or in that situation, which means for me, which means for us, that we haven't yet made up our minds, 
And so what we're doing is we're weighing out our, our best options, right? We're trying to decide based on what we perceive in the moment is the best for us right now. I mean, it might not be the best for us five years from now. It may not be the best for us even five minutes from now. But for right now, you know, our considering means that we haven't yet settled our minds. We haven't yet settled our hearts on a concrete decision yet. For Paul, for the Philippian believers, Paul isn't saying, folks, weigh your options. Weigh your options right now, right in the moment. If it feels good to you right in this moment at this time, proceed to think about someone else's position. Proceed to think about someone else's feelings above your own. No, he's saying, church, believers in Christ Jesus, fix your attention on this. He says, you know, focus your gaze upon. That's what the word consider means. Get focused. And so for, for most of us, if Paul were looking at our lives, maybe he would say, church, your focus needs more focus. Your focus needs more focus. Consider, fix your gaze upon the fact that others need to be more valuable. Others need to be more important than yourselves. And then finally he goes and he, and he says, don't look to your own interests. He says, you know, don't look to the things that only you're interested in. Also look for the interests of others. So in other words, sometimes you and I, in thinking about others, sometimes we need to speak up for people who can't speak for themselves. And that's why Paul and Jesus and, and so many others, you know, in the Word of God, when they're addressing, especially when they're addressing the church, they would make a point of pointing out the need for us as believers in Christ Jesus to continually Look after the widows and the orphans, the last, the lost, and the least among us. And so all of this can be summed up in, in one word, really, and it's the word humility. And I know sometimes, you know, I've said it before that sometimes people think that humility is about thinking less of ourselves. You know, oh, woe is me and, and kind of self-abasement. But really, the core and the crux of humility is just thinking about ourselves less you know not always us first but others first Jesus himself in Luke chapter 14 verse 11 he says for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled but those who humble themselves will be exalted all who exalt themselves will be humbled but whoever humbles themselves Will be exalted. Proverbs 3 verse 34. And I, this is in the New Living Translation. It says the Lord mocks the mockers. But is gracious. To the humble. Another translation. Says that the Lord opposes the proud. In other words. If we're always me first in our lives. If we're always that me centric. You know world view. That we live life. We will become frustrated, bumping up against God, because that's not God's will. It's not his plan and his design for us as the people of God to always be thinking about ourselves. So we bump up against God, but it says, but he gives grace to the humble. And so Paul is giving the Philippians the basic principle of humility that he wants them to live by in their daily lives and verses 1 through 4. He, and now in verse 5, he begins to switch and he says, now I'm going to give you a picture, a, an example of how Jesus Christ carried out this, these very principles of humility in his daily life. It's a, it's a picture of complete and total selflessness and humility. So let's look at it. In verse 5, Paul begins and he says, you know, in your relationships with, with each other, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ with, 
uh, with which he lets them know that whatever, you know, whatever he's now going to be telling them, that they now, because it's the mindset of Christ, they need to apply this to every area of their lives, right? I mean, all the arenas of their lives, they need to apply this. In other words, all of their relationships, whether it be their spouses or with their children or, you know, with their co-workers or, you know, with the people that, that are their family members or with the family of God, their brothers and sisters in the Lord or anyone else that they're in relationship with. This applies to you. So listen to verses 6 and 7. Again, the attitude of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And so the first mindset that Paul says for the believers that they need to have, and so that, that we need to have as believers here and now, is the word sacrifice. I want you to notice that Paul says here that Jesus didn't consider his heavenly position and his equality with God the Father something that he had to tightly hold on to or tightly grasp, but rather it says he emptied himself. He poured himself out. He sacrificed, in other words. And so when you think about Jesus... And you think about him before he came from heaven to earth. He's, he's in heaven. He's got the perfect setup, right? There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There's no suffering. There's no difficulties. Angels and all the heavenly hosts are worshiping him. And he chooses to give that all up. He voluntarily surrenders that and sacrifices that, that which was valuable to him. And he comes down from heaven to earth. Not to be a king, but to be a carpenter. Actually, more than a carpenter, to be a suffering servant. Remember Isaiah talking about the suffering servant who was coming, well acquainted with, with grief? That was Jesus. And so the question for you and for me today becomes, now if we say that we want to be like Jesus... Do we really? I mean, are we willing? Are we willing to give up the things that we think are valuable to us? Whether it be our time or, or our, our money or, or maybe our need to be right or our need to be heard or, you know, to, to live free, to be able to do whatever it is that we want to do whenever we want to do it in, you know, in our freedom. And, and he's saying, are you willing? Are you willing to sacrifice for those that we're in relationship with? For those who are our family or our co-workers or our family members or in the family of God together? What are we willing? What are we willing to sacrifice? So the second mindset that Paul says to the Philippian believers that they need to adapt is that, you know, if they say that we want to live like Christ... Not only be sacrificial in our living, but also the willingness to be a servant. Now, notice Paul in verse 7, he says that Jesus Christ, he took on the, the form of a servant. So now we see Jesus taking another step down in terms of humility in that he didn't just come to the earth to be a king and to be served by humanity, but... Rather, every time we see Jesus Christ on the earth, he's in, remember, he's in that pre-exalted state. He's in the state of serving, a servant of all. He's, he's serving people. He's washing their feet. He is feeding people. He is raising people from the dead. He's comforting them. He's binding up the brokenhearted. He is being their comforter, their healer. And so the question that we're challenged with now is, like, do do we look more often to be served in our lives? Or do I look to serve other people? Do I see myself 
as being above doing certain things, certain tasks, because maybe they're beneath me or they're beneath us? Or do I see myself as being willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done? Well, the third mindset that Paul says that the Philippian believers needs to have and to, ad to adapt is if, if we say that we want to live like Jesus, it's a life of submission. It's a life of submission. And notice that it says here in verse 8 that Jesus was willing to become obedient, even to the point of death. And so we see Jesus now taking yet another step down toward humility in the sense that before Jesus Christ ever even got to, to earth, he first had to be willing to be submissive to the Father. Now remember, Jesus was just as much God as God the Father, and yet for this assignment, he had to be willing to surrender, willing to submit, willing to forego, willing to give up. And that for the, you know, all that for the love of the Father, the love that he had for you, and the love that he has for, for me. And so the question that we've got to ask ourselves, and, and remember, he had to repeat that time and time again, and culminating in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will be done, but, but yours. So the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, how submissive am I? How submissive am I willing to be in terms of my relationships? You know, whether it be my wife, whether it be my with you know with our husbands or with our co-workers or with our church leadership or whether it be the flight attendant who is telling you to fasten your seatbelt there's you know remain in your seat for the the turbulence that are coming right or to put your cell phone away or your baggage tuck them under right before takeoff or am i the kind of person that always seems to feel the need to be in control having other people submit to or bend to you know my will or to follow my lead well the last one it's probably not one that any of us particularly like because it's the whole idea of suffering but i want us to notice with the previous verse it says that jesus was obedient to the point of death and now it says even death on a cross even death on a cross. So the idea here is that Jesus was willing to suffer. He was willing to voluntarily go through all that he went through, all the tribulations, all the trials, so that you and I could become recipients of eternal life here and now and an eternal hope one day face to face with him. And one of the things that just drives me crazy because it's not true is the thinking that some people have some people in the church have that the christian life that you know once we have our come to jesus moment in life then everything is going to be easy everything should should be okay everything should work out with kind of a fairy tale ending you know perfect health perfect wealth and everything is supposed to just work out perfectly and it's it's simply not true i mean whenever we look at the life of christ on this earth. I mean, in many ways, it was completely the opposite of that. His, his life was marked with pain. His, mark, his life was marked with struggle alongside of everybody else. He, was, he went through temptation. He went through adversity. And ultimately, he and he alone had to be willing to suffer and die, even a death on a cross. So Paul is reminding the Philippian believers, you know, that their struggles, they're not going through that in, in a vacuum. They're not going through that on their own island. They are part of humanity that are going through it together. And more than that, they're going through it as believers in Christ Jesus for the sake of the gospel. And they are sharing in the sufferings of Jesus Christ that the very things they're going through, don't worry. Jesus has gone through all those things as well. And so that's, a, that's for us too. There's a, a question in there for us too that, you know, if we say we want to live 
for Jesus and we want to live like Jesus Christ, how willing am I even to be inconvenienced in this life? How, how willing am I at times to, to suffer? To suffer for the gospel. To suffer even in my relationships here and now. So what does it mean, church, for us to have the mind of Christ? It means that we must be willing to sacrifice. We must be willing to serve one another. We must be willing to be submissive to one another, to lay down any perceived rights for the sake of one another, and to ultimately suffer if and when it presents itself in my life. Instead of running from it, running to Jesus in the midst of it. But the blessing in this whole passage comes in verse 9, and it says, because Jesus Christ was willing to humble himself, because Jesus Christ was willing, you know, to sacrifice and serve and, and submit, God has exalted him. God has given him the name that's above every other name. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every knee right, will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So God exalted him. And God has exalted Jesus uniquely. There's no one else that was to be the Savior of the world. No one else that is now at the right hand of the Father. But there is a blessing for you and for me as well, knowing that if we follow the example of Christ, if we adapt and adopt this mindset, this same mindset as, as Jesus Christ, if, if God the Father exalted Jesus Christ in due time, in due time, you and I will experience the blessings of God. It may be next week, it may be next month, next year, it may be in this lifetime, or it may, you have to, you may have to wait for all of its fulfillment in eternity, face to face with the Father. But don't, don't think that we're going to miss out on the blessings of God announcing, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy and happiness forevermore of the Father. Don't we all want to be blessed by God's own loving hand? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have exalted Jesus to the highest place. And in our lives, we need to do the same. We need to make Jesus preeminent in our lives. First, the first and last word in our lives, that everything is now Christ-centered and Christ-centric instead of me first, instead of my will, instead of my agenda and my ways. That we make Jesus Lord of our lives. That's our prayer. So continue to show and reveal to us the mindset of Jesus Christ. Show us areas where we need to be more sacrificial. Show us areas that we need to be more in servant mode with one another. Show us areas where we need to submit and to lay down our own agendas for the sake of our own brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Lord, show us what it means to suffer for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord God, I pray that you would empower our living by your Holy Spirit. And that we would live for your glory. That we would see your glory that we would reveal your glory to the world. This we pray in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every other name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.
Who? <laughs>